Please rise. <clears throat> Let us bow our heads and hearts in prayer to God. Gracious God, from whom all skill and science flow, we pause to adore your name as we begin to celebrate some of our accomplishments. As we acknowledge that apart from you we can do nothing, we rejoice that with us you choose to do great things. We thank you for this place of learning that has been dedicated to making a sincere effort at helping youth to see all things through the mind of Christ. Thank you, Lord, for the dedication of administration teachers and parents. Thank you for the dedication of the students to the goal of equipping themselves for service. Thank you for the message that has been prepared for us. May it be a challenge to all and be used to glorify your holy name. Gracious Lord, how great are your riches, how deep your wisdom and knowledge. Who can explain your decisions? Who can understand your ways? Who can know your mind, O Lord, who is able to give you advice? Whoever gave you anything for which you should repay him? All things were made by you, and all things exist through you and for you. And to you be glory forever and ever. In Jesus' name, amen. Welcome to this, the commencement ceremonies for the class of 1971. I consider it a special privilege today to introduce to this audience a very dear friend whom I have come to know through the years as an associate among the private colleges here in Minnesota. Sister Alberta Huber establishes some kind of a precedent today for she is the first representative of a woman's college speaking on this platform and the first representative of a woman's Roman Catholic college. And we're indeed honored to have her here today. My association with her, of course, uh, begins with those interesting junkets which college presidents have to take as they are teamed up to go out and beg for money. And that's literally true. We do gather several times during the year as college presidents and we do team up, and we take our tin cups and our mendicant robes, and we go out and knock on the doors. And Sister Alberta and I have been out on just such missions. And she has served as a member of the executive secretary of our fund for several years. We meet also in connection with the activities of the Minnesota Private College Council. And this year, we have been sitting together quite frequently in the halls of the legislature because we have been very interested in the kind of legislation which has been prepared and we have seen passed in the legislature for the private college sector of higher education. We count her as a friend also because she represents a college with whom we have a great deal to do, St. Catharines. We share a faculty member in the person of Sister Agnes. We also share in the program in the classics and we have in many ways felt a very great bond of affection for the folks over at St. Catharines. And so I'm happy to present her to you today and I continue to try and find out her secret uh, in connection with getting that beautiful O'Shaughnessy Hall over there at St. Catharines. I think someday we ought to have a hall like that on the Augsburg campus and share it with the city of Minneapolis. So I'm going to keep my dream and my acquaintance uh, with Sister Alberta as strong as I can. It gives me a great pleasure to introduce to this audience Sister Alberta Huber, the president of the College of St. Catherine, speaking on the subject, Clarity of Vision. Sister Alberta. I am 
am very honored to be here. And Dr. Anderson, the secret in O'Shaughnessy Auditorium is Mr. O'Shaughnessy. <laughs> The other secret is the federal government with which you are already acquainted. <laughs> President Anderson, members of the Board of Regents, faculty, friends, parents, and members of the graduating class. Like the disciples on Pentecost, you graduates sit in this room today wondering what's going to happen to you perhaps at this moment hoping for the mighty wind. <laughs> Which might be the fans. <laughs> perhaps a little afraid of what lies ahead, you, ahead of you as those disciples were. Perhaps confident, but perhaps not really knowing with what gift you have been endowed. For whether you are in that group anticipating and dreading future shock, or among those who expect to take over the greening of America. You've been hearing it said far too often of late, recently in Time Magazine, that you are overeducated and in oversupply, neither of which is your fault. Rather than a warm welcome at the end of four quite expensive years, in spite of our tin cups, rather than a warm welcome to the ranks of those who are going to save the world from or for the rest of us, you are met with statistics about unemployment and scarcity of jobs. And I'm sure you've already been through this. And if you have a job, I congratulate you. You will be told of inflation and its effects on the job market, as well as the effects on colleges and universities that you have already heard about. You're well enough aware that tuition in private colleges has risen 150% in 10 years. Higher ed education everywhere is in a parlous state. You're leaving that behind. And as you complete your present stint in the halls of academe, you're probably glad enough to leave, leave these particular problems to the people you leave behind you to worry about. Like all graduating classes in all colleges and universities in this country, you're only too well aware of problems that beset you. You don't need a commencement ad address to remind you of them. Still less do you need one that will ignore these problems and try to paint your future in glowing hues or your place in it as secure and affluent. Perhaps after listening to years of lectures, you could do without one of any kind. But here I am with one to give you. You may be able to remember this commencement, as Dr. Anderson said, not for what I say, but merely for the fact that I'm here. At our own commencement last week, Senator Mondale remarked that he could not remember anything of the commencement address at his graduation, nor could he remember the speaker. And I had a guilty feeling as he said this that neither could I. <laughs> but since this is the first time at an Augsburg commencement convocation that you have been addressed by a woman and a Catholic, these two firsts, you may remember it for that. For whatever larger significance this fact may have, you have to wait for the future. I do consider it, however, a mark of the kind of change that has been taking place at Augsburg in the past few years, during the time that I have known uh, Dr. Anderson and have gone on these financial junkets with him, perhaps even during the years in which this graduating class has been at the college. As I observe the situation from across the river, and it's easy to observe Augsburg not only because we're close to it, because it's the only private college in Minneapolis. There are lots of us in St. Paul, so we sometimes become sort of amalgamated. But since there's only one, it's easy for me to look over and Watch what's going on here with admiration. I see you reaching outward into the neighborhood in which you are providentially, I think, situated, partly by choice in having elected not to move elsewhere, and partly because history and tradition has located you here a century ago in the heart of the civic community of Minneapolis. 
I see you involved in the problems of higher education in Minnesota and the Midwest and the various consortium associations in which Augsburg is an active member. And I watch you move into ecumenism and the relation of one religious group to another. As Dr. Anderson mentioned, through a combination of two of these trends, plus just the practical conditions of a need to be met, Sister Agnes Ward has been a member of the Classics faculty on both our campuses for several years. And in spite of having to attend two commencements and double sets of faculty meetings and having vacations that never quite coincide, she and we with her has found the experience valuable and a happy one. Furthermore, Augsburg is now a member of a consortium including four other Twin City colleges, of which St. Catharines is a member. The agreement allows free exchange of students in any courses in the curricula of any of the five colleges. And thus, in a way, Augsburg has extended its campus to St. Paul. The first outward movement that I mentioned, the really exemplary concern which Augsburg has shown in the problems of urban Minneapolis, has resulted, I suppose, in your Metro Urban Studies program, which in one sense makes a virtue of necessity, since it's only barely likely that you could continue to exist in the present Metro Urban environment without paying it some heed. But it also makes use of the educational resources around the college and brings to them the insights of philosophy and political science, the generalizations of sociology and the understandings of psychology Somewhat too much is expected of colleges in providing solutions for all the problems that beset the human race. But none of us can refuse to give what we have to give. And Augsburg has been a leader in doing so here. But it's the very magnitude and number of these problems, which will be studied in this major, that make it, I think, difficult for you to face your world today knowing that somehow you are expected to right all wrongs, eliminate all injustice, halt pollution, and improve the quality of life if you are to survive at all. It's likewise difficult for me, for one of the generation supposedly in charge, to give you some kind of message that's not trite and hackneyed, but sincere and realistic and at the same time encouraging. As we look around us today, the outlook is not particularly encouraging. There are wars and rumors of wars. There are signs in the earth and the air and the sea, all kinds of apocalyptic signs that make sometimes the day sound more like Armageddon than Pentecost. It sometimes seems that judgment is about to descend upon us. Everywhere there are more problems of human suffering than we have even begun to alleviate. I could spend all afternoon citing these problems. I'm not going to relax, feel relieved. But even with a new emphasis on minority studies, our colleges have not solved the problem of racism, not even on campuses where we are presumably more enlightened than elsewhere in human relations. And although on our campuses in the Twin Cities, and I could cite St. Catharines and Augsburg, I think, there is less unreasonable response to tension, violence elsewhere touches us, whether we will it or no. Drug abuse, brutality, murder, rioting. This is a violent age indeed. It's no wonder that many young people, I hope you are not among them, but I suppose some of you are, Many young people have rejected traditional teaching, whether in the church or in the college, simply because they have sought solutions there and have not found them. But when a self-styled radical like Saul Alinsky reminds us that the most practical life is the moral life, and as he says, the moral life is the only road to survival, he is reminding us to look again at the moral base of religion. When there is so much question about our priorities and where they really lie, it becomes more and more important that not only should our wills respond in a moral way, but our minds must be able to distinguish truth from falsity, valid from invalid, 
and provide solutions with a moral base to human problems if we are to make life endure and enduring be endurable. As I've said, I hear it often remarked that many are overeducated. I find this inconceivable. Overtrained, perhaps, overspecialized, or maybe because trained in the wrong thing, over rigid. But how could someone have too much intellectual development, too much skill in reasoning and persuading, too much knowledge of the history and the nature of men and women and institutions, too much of the liberating effect of the wisdom that should be the end and the reward of higher education? At present, we may have too many engineers, perhaps too many teachers. In a few years, we may have too many doctors, lawyers, social workers. But we cannot have too many intelligent, flexible people who can train and retrain again and again to meet new needs. Perhaps now, when job security is not the light at the end of the baccalaureate tunnel, and we are freed of the limiting objective of going to college in order to get a job, we may again consider the true value of education to be in learning itself and in the wisdom it brings to those who must struggle with or without jobs through a chaotic world which seems to have lost the serenity of true education. In an explosion of knowledge which has surrounded and disturbed us in the last 20 years, and most of you don't remember this, an explosion which sometimes seems to have fragmented itself into billions of dollars worth of gadgets. When the mind boggles at what there is to be encompassed, there is the real possibility that many will take the way out of anti-intellectualism, of rejecting what can one cannot easily handle. The cop-out may solve an immediate individual problem, but contributes very little, if anything, to the service of humanity. Only a conscious and deliberate, not a desperate witness to higher values, higher values than material acquisitions, can be of general significance to those genuinely seeking the good life. In such a conscious and vital reordering of priorities, the educated person with the ability to see issues clearly to feel compassion, to set goals and uphold idea, ideals, can direct his talents and energy to changing and improving the condition of society with more skill and perception than if he attempts to work out of ignorance or emotion. I believe such a person can carry out the task with hope, and I believe that an educated person is such. Recently, I received in the mail a small publication, which I read, I don't always read these, containing a brief dedicatory eulogy of Hugh Galusha, in his lifetime a prominent and dedicated citizen of Minneapolis. Many of you in the audience knew him, I'm sure. The writer described him in terms that I think characterize accurately the liberally educated person. I quote, he believed with all his being in the life of the mind, which meant more than pure reason. It involved creative response to evidence, a remaking of contexts which would allow for change, a belief that knowledge and perception manifest themselves in the rhythms of daily lives." Unquote. If this description cannot be applied to you graduates now, I hope it can. It will be true of you when, you have, when what you have learned sharpens into focus and you become aware of your own clarity of vision and grow to have confidence in it. Clarity of vision is one quality which education in a Christian college should give to all who pursue higher learning with goodwill in such a faith community even if one does, does not share intimately in that faith or a particular expression of it, but particularly so if one is active. In the Christian community, knowledge, although an end in itself, 
has been accompanied always by a concern for service of one's fellow man and a use of the gift of knowledge for his benefit. I believe this is still true in the Christian college. In the past year, much effort has been put forth by individuals and groups in attempting to get state and federal governments to give education at all levels priority in public spending. Dr. Anderson and I have spent a good deal of our time uh, engaged in this work. In the course of this effort, legislators were made aware of the contribution of private higher education to the public good. The legislature of the state of Minnesota did recognize this contribution, and in other states, similar attempts are being made to convince those legislatures of the economy resulting when they make it possible for students to attend already existing institutions rather than provide new ones at greater public expense. While all this is very good, and at the end of the road you are very well aware that it is, no one in any way attached to a private college doubts that it would be beneficial to have some help in bridging the gap between private college tuition and that in public colleges. No one has raised any question about the quality and effectiveness of private colleges. And in fact, it impressed me quite a bit that many questions asked this year were rather groping attempts to find out just what it was that made private colleges the valuable institutions they are. They, as we were well aware, that there was a difference. It is well to remind ourselves, just within the family, so to speak, of the additional benefits one receives with a private college education and the additional responsibilities one thereby incurs. In Minnesota, it's not easy to keep in mind that Pentecost was a harvest festival, the spring harvest. But as you come now to the harvest time of your four years, more or less, of work, time, money, an emotional drain, and are ready to garner the fruits of your efforts to receive a diploma with all its rights and privileges, what do you have that warrants what it has cost you, your parents, benefactors of the college, and the administration and faculty? I know that it's easy, easier to be aware of that added benefit, which is much more than the lanyap you receive with your purchase of credits and courses than it is to be able to define it. But I am convinced that you have a clarity of vision beyond that ordinarily to be expected of one who has had a liberal arts education. With an education informed by faith, encouraged by hope, animated by charity, you can seek after and follow wisdom with determination and courage. And it will be possible for you to devote the fruits of your wisdom to the betterment of humanity. You can, I think, go out today full of hope that this is possible for you. As you wait to be sent out on your Pentecost mission, we pray that the Spirit of God will enlighten your minds and keep clear your vision. We also pray that whenever and wherever you see clearly, you will have the courage to follow your convictions. And I wish you well as you go on your way. Thank you, Sister Alberta. I don't know whether you and I are going to be able to hang on in these positions long enough to meet some of these people in the business world when we go out and visit them, but uh, at any rate, uh, there will be somebody there to, in the days to come, to help fulfill, through the continuation of this and our sister institutions, the kind of vision that Sister Alberta has spoken of this afternoon. Thank you very much. Now, I'm not going to uh, assume any divine prerogative 
But on this Pentecost, I am going to call for a mighty rushing wind. And they can turn on the fans right now. If nothing happens, you know I don't even have the power to do that. <laughs> Aha. <laughs> this does not mean that you're not going to be able to hear me. It only means that you will have to turn up the threshold of your ears so that, uh, or your hearing aids, so that uh, you can find out what's going on, I hope. I shall now recognize and ask to come to the podium Dr. Kenneth Bailey, the Vice President for Academic Affairs and Dean of the College, to present the graduates for graduation, the candidates for graduation. Dr. Bailey. Mr. Ramberg, Sister Huber, President Anderson, it is my pleasure to present to you the graduating class of 1971. The class is composed of a number of groups, each identifiable, and each of which I think should be mentioned for your information. It has been our practice at Augsburg College for a number of years to hold only one commencement ceremony during the academic year. And hence, at this one occasion during the year, we include in the graduating group students who have completed their coursework at the end of the fall term, November 24, 1970, at the end of our winter term, March 2, 1971, and have just now, this past week, completed the requirements for graduation. Included in this group is also a group of students who anticipate completion of their requirements by the end of the summer session in August of 1971. If you have read your program, you have noticed that among the graduates are a number of those graduating with honors. Some, summa cum laude, with highest honors. Some, magna cum laude, with high honors. And some, cum laude. Their names are in your program for you to read at your leisure. You'll be able to identify the honor students as they come to the platform because they will be the ones wearing the gray and maroon cord and tassel on the left shoulder of their academic garb. It is always a distinct pleasure for an academic dean to present a class for graduation. For deans, as well as anyone, are aware of the potential and sometimes real stumbling stones that stand between the student and successful completion of his education. We are the victims of one such minor problem today. On the 25th of March, the diplomas and covers were ordered for the college 
They have not yet been received. In one way, it is a tragedy to have to announce this to the graduates. On the other hand, I must admit to some feeling of satisfaction to realize that all of society's problems are not centered on education. In lieu of a diploma, today you will be given a certificate which will contain instructions for you to request <laughs> mailing of the diploma to whatever address you prefer. I think the chuckle that some of you may not have understood is due to the fact that by this time in the year, the graduating class and the faculty are sick and tired of receiving instructions about commencement. In spite of the difficulties and in spite of the fact that education in this day and age is a rocky road at best, I would like to second Sister Huber's words and say to the audience that we at Augsburg College are indeed proud of this fine group of young people. We are not happy to see them graduate because we shall miss them, but we are happy that they will be representatives of the college in a variety of walks of life. And that they will represent us with a clarity of vision, which we hope will be better than that which we of an older generation have too often displayed. It is my great pleasure then to present to you, the audience, to Mr. Ramberg, Chairman of the Board of Regents, and to the President of the College, the graduating class of 1971. Will the August candidates please rise? Upon the completion of your work this summer, Augsburg College will confer upon you the degree of Bachelor of Arts. I give to you our congratulations in advance. You may be seated. In order that we may recognize the individuals in this class who graduate with distinction, I shall ask that those who will graduate with the degree Bachelor of Arts, summa cum laude, to please stand. <laughs> will the graduates who are to receive the degree Bachelor of Arts, magna cum laude, please stand. Will the graduates who are received the degree Bachelor of Arts cum laude please stand? We are happy to recognize your achievements and congratulate you for them. Now I shall ask that the entire class rise. By virtue of the authority entrusted to me by the Faculty and Board of Regents of Augsburg College, I now confer upon you the degree of Bachelor of Arts with all rights and privileges thereof, as this degree is evidence of a successfully completed college course. May it always serve as a reminder that in life, the highest aim is truth. You may be seated. Dean Bailey will announce the names of the members of the class as they come to the platform, 
All members are to come forward, including those who will complete their work in August. Mr. Leonard F. Ramberg, Chairman of the Board of Regents, will join me in the presentation of the diplomas in absentia, assisted by Ms. Mildred Joel, the Registrar. This is one thing you will have to remember this commencement by. Dean Bailey. Congratulations to the members of the graduating class and also to the Dean of the College for getting through the reading of that list. Maybe next year I should have him preach the sermon and I'll read the list. No, that won't work. Uh, but that's uh, quite a class and we congratulate all of you. Now I'm going to ask you to uh, be reminded of the fact that the class is to recess after these exercises are completed and form a circle out in Murphy Square so that all your admirers that have already indicated their presence here today uh, will be able to congratulate you more fully. And then I want to take this occasion to just insert something very briefly because I do not want this occasion to pass without paying one more word of tribute and respect to a professor at this college who this year is retiring after near four, nearly four decades of teaching, Miss Ann Peterson. Miss Peterson, will you stand? Now I would like to recognize and ask to come to the podium Mr. E. William Anderson, the president of the Augsburg Alumni Association, after he has delivered the welcome on behalf of the Alumni Association, we will call on the Reverend Edward T. Chinball to pronounce the benediction. Mr. Anderson. Sister Alberta, Dr. Anderson, ladies and gentlemen of the graduating class of 1971, it is my extreme pleasure as president of the Alumni Association of Augsburg College to accept you now into the membership of that organization. As members of the Augsburg College Alumni Association, it will be your responsibility to encourage and support the development and strengthening of the college in its program. May I assure you of a warm welcome into the fellowship of Augsburg alumni and an exciting challenge in the support of Christian higher education. Remember, no matter what you do from this day forth, you will be representing Augsburg. Let's make everyone as proud of Augsburg as we are of you today. Goodbye and good luck. Let us stand. Bow your hearts unto God and receive the benediction. May God's love give you confidence. May God's truth give you direction. May God's eternalness give you peace and hope this day and all your days. Amen.